Hi, everybody. My name is Christopher Whitaker, and this is the Open Gov Chicago meeting. We're going to be getting started in a few minutes. Um, you won't see, we're not going to do as much video like of the people speaking because uh, we're using a projector. But anything on the projector, I'm going to throw on screen share so you'll be able to see what's going on and follow along. Um, if you're watching and you have Twitter, if you could just tweet me at Civic Whitaker just to let me know this is working. I appreciate it. Thanks. And we'll get started. Next. So do you think this mayor is different? Mayor I don't get the sense that he's. Well, I don't know. He doesn't have to say it. I don't think so. No, I'm uh, something like that. I'm just uh, helping with the broadcast. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Uh, I'm using the Google Hangout. I'm using the Google Hangout because everything on the Hangout gets recorded to YouTube. And then when I do my post about it later, I can just move to the YouTube video. And... You know, um, it list under my like, specific web page, you know, but uh, it'll be on the smart Chicago blog. That's the only thing I don't like about uh, Google Hangout is I can't record under the page, the smart Chicago page. It has to record to the individual's channel. In a way that I understand, uh, I got a, I bought a new DSL camera, but it previously was uh, uh, as far as some of the so in the urban side of that, the treat, but they don't have better activities. I'm saying, I'm going to pick up this policy. Sorry. Uh, there are business units in the Similar to about one of the if we were to look at the cities, what you just said is amazing. <laughs> so I wish I had taped that. Um, no, that's so that, that's so I'm very interested in. Are you familiar now? This might seem a little. This is probably um, 
on the margin. But are you familiar with the pioneers movement? Um, I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, there's a very powerful woman. She's from India, and she's all about free. She's all about um, heirloom seeds, non genetically modified seeds for, for food. But really, what Bioneers is about is about how, how do you. We live as human beings on the planet in the same way as the planet does. Yeah, like how do how do we become? How do we learn from the systems of science and technology and everything else? How to to live responsibly? Um, so there are a lot of people who are urban planners who are. Um, <laughs> You know, who are kind of thinking along the fringes of all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, not necessarily there's some sort of some species of tree or plant that has a leaf. The way that it sheds water, I mean, it causes a lot of and um, as they took a closer look at it, there was, there was sort of a structure to the material that caused that water so uh, engineers in the glass industry are looking at that. So they're coming Now a very expensive proposition. So where are you going to build that's great. So, I mean, that's just one of the That's great. So, it's similar to, to what you're thinking. It's not that it's certainly not great. It's, it's, it's not fully mainstream, but it's really something that's in the they're thinking about. Yeah, I'm trying to get up. Yeah. The only reason I call Bioneers Fringe is because when they had their gathering last year at the USA, um, they had a lot of poets. You know? They had a lot of young, you know, poets getting up there and going, "I'm in the lilac," kind of thing. And there was some great dancing, you know, dance groups and stuff from all over. The but but there was also a lot of scientific kind of. Stuff. Yeah, but there, there was the yeah, yeah, a little bit of that one soon. <laughs> so, well, it's great. It does seem like you know this breakdown. So what happened? Kind of with silos, these academic or professional practice silos. So badly needed. Yeah. Oh God. We're moving through this phase of science taking us for last deeper and deeper. And I think, you know, sort of the DNA thing. 
the conclusions the ways in which you know I studied for that Buddhism the nature principle that is honored in Tibetan Buddhism, the people misunderstand yeah. is, it's every, um, it's the same every day. is, you know, they, they use the term emptiness, and the idea of the emptiness we means that there's no, but there's only two people, check me in, kind of and there's like a hundred people. Right, so they don't, and things like, are kind of devoid of meaning on their own. Like even make and they only mean something the way that they're not doing they're all down, so they're just kind of As Dan says, he's like, and, under, and understanding yeah, that, it. and behaving What's in a minimum in your life that understands that. So, you don't, so you're, you're not in a position where you, you, know, you freak out. You don't operate as a silo. You don't act as a silo. So um, it's really it's fascinating. My friend TJ, yeah, it's interesting. You know, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We're finding out we're no one's in here watching Hi everyone watching the live feed. Um, we'll be getting started in a few minutes. Uh, we're mostly going to be using the screen share because, as you can probably tell, nobody looks good behind projector. Um, so stay tight. We'll be getting going in a couple of minutes. I mean, I used to, um, I was a fundraiser for a homeless shelter, and this was a while ago. They were trying to create a whole system um, to really actually address homelessness in Seattle. And it was, you know, 20 organizations in this day. And trying to agree on everything. So just an update, it's about 618. Apparently there's a long line in security. We, um, there was uh, a couple of VIPs, uh, 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 diplomat type people in the building just before you guys got here. I think that might be associated with it. Also, we failed to, sometimes we printed out the sheets. We failed to do that. So Ramsen will be here, and we're just going to wait just a few more minutes, and then people will get up. We can obviously go later than 8. Um, 
Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to let you know. Hello and welcome. Me too. I was like the first person here, and I had my badge. I had my badge for John three times. But then again, yeah. You know. <laughs> But so, you know, how do we get how do we get communication between people to operate as efficiently? You know, how do we get information to move? Private <laughs> Oh, yeah. Especially as people who are as as all the what do you think? I hope so. I don't, you know, I, I'm a real supporter of open golf, but this, is, this will be a get great program for me because I work, you know, so I work for, when I work for Mayor Daly, the way information is dealt with there. <laughs> And so, you know, and so I've been talking about the meetings, but they were joint meetings that they had to talk about. Can you look how we're using the city's information portal? And all this great stuff. But sometimes it's a real mess, and I do not. And at one point I said to somebody, and I was talking about this, I said, the reason why it's a mess is because the system internally cannot negotiate. Cannot negotiate the data in a way. In all aspects of it. It's like one of the things I did, I also looked at the board about one year, which is what turned my hair gray. But I mean, when I worked there, there's something called the board report. It's a system piece of paper that goes to the board. I walked, I, I did a lot of process engineering kind of things, and I walked a board report through its process of that at the school. It took two days. I like I like this design. It took so long. So with those systems internally in an organization like City Hall, um, that if they're not fixed, all the all the websites, all you know, all of it doesn't mean it's what. We just hired a guy. this guy's measure of all stuff to city the people that are and this is a huge game changer. There's a lot of risk in there. There's a lot of trench culture of 
There's no reward for the life. The idea of hurting people. He said it's not a money problem. He said it's actually money to do these things. He said it's, it's a personnel culture problem. He's trying to get these people to engage in the given the culture of lack of incentive. That's, that's, that's exactly what I would say. Culture change. Because that's what I was working on. I was working on culture change. I was trying to create you know, more efficient systems. And I was working with you know, top process engineers. But it was like the people within the departments were resistant. The commissioners were kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> How do we meet the um, sound of this without actually doing it? They said you could just write something in a paper where you're a bright young person and you don't miss it. But you realize you're just off this mess and that person who love this. They they can tell you what you're doing. Go out on that little Yeah, so I, I, you know, I really have to get that. God is, the God is aggressive internally as well. And actually, I was, um, I'm a female reservist. I didn't even know there was something. So when Hurricane Sandy, I was not more than New Jersey. I was doing digital communications. I was basically monitoring what was being said on social media. And um, but what I learned afterwards, they had created a team that created a piece that was kind of separate from the whole operation. And this is people who think there probably people in this room who were following this in the process. During the disaster, and making recommendations for fixing it. And they were really good. They were taking in social media feeds. Well, I was just monitoring the social media feeds to understand the needs were These guys were like process, process engineers, you know, um, I don't know. You know, name transportation people, uh, anything you need to do with them. That was watching everything, and making recommendations. So I was like, which is why I was actually deployed. That was the first time that they had ever deployed any, anybody in the presentation. Um, yeah, because I mean, basically, I was able to um, and I was working with two, three really young, enthusiastic people. Okay, let's get started, everybody, please. So it was like, um, thank you for attending the uh, meetup of the Open Gov Chicago. Uh, thoughtful critiques of the open government movement. All the important things are right here. The women's restroom code is 123. The men's restroom code is 321. The Wi-Fi code is the trust phone number. Why do they think that that's easy to remember? <laughs> Who ever calls the Chicago Community Trust switchboard? Nobody. I call them every day. 312-616-8000. Um, so uh, we're really excited about uh, uh, tonight. Um, because we have uh, three speakers who um, we, uh, we're going to provide what we say they're going to provide, thoughtful critiques of the open government movement. Um, I think we framed it pretty well. I don't think there's much room for me to talk much about it, but we should do the announcements. Um, uh, Jerry, uh, I saw you here, Jerry, if you wanted to say anything extra about it, but Wagon is an emerging data wiki platform that's architected for publicly curated data and more. Uh, he's a core developer on it. Um, anything else you want to say about that? I just, just identify myself. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's a super wiki platform that is used for a lot of things. Okay. Reusable data, that's good. Um, also, yes, yeah, so we have three other viewers in here. If anybody <coughs> can hop into this and help us uh, with, the, with the notes, um, that would be awesome. 
uh, uh, Charlie Quinton, I don't know if you're here, uh, Watershed Health and Open Data for uh, Building Knowledge Resources, RICO Activists, linked to the social media uh, compendium website for the United States Geological Service? There you go, yeah. So that's interesting. People like Twitter, apparently. Um, uh, Shamila, uh, Shamila. Uh, Life Race Chicago user group. I don't know if she, is uh, Shamila here. Anything you like? Okay. Well, we got that in there. Lynn Bergstrom talking about the the Civic Lab Chicago Tiffel and Lynn Nation project. This is a uh, a website. I mean, I'm sorry, a YouTube video about it. Um, Ian, let's raise the roof for Ian. Um, yes, the two Open Street Map events. Um, we talked about this before, but it's certainly worth announcing, right? Ian, can you talk a little bit about what you did with the uh, with OpenStreetMap recently in concert? <coughs> and it is concert, right? It's sort of like dance and the, the handoff, like a baton uh, with the city of Chicago, Ian? Yeah, so um, in, in the last couple of months, the city of Chicago released uh, some data on GitHub, and I took that data and put it into OpenStreetMap. Um, one of the data Set that they released was the buildings, building footprints data set, which happened to have a bunch of addresses in it, which is very useful to OpenStreetMap because OpenStreetMap has a geocoder, which uh, you, so you can do free text searching in OpenStreetMap data and get any address in the city of Chicago, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, that's one of the interesting features of the data. Um, and they also released a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the pedway, bike routes, bike racks, and all that stuff is, um, you can fork it on GitHub and add, make changes to it. Suggest changes, like if you see a bike rack that isn't there on their data, you can make a change to the data set and then push it back to them and they'll merge it in, in theory, right, Tom? Um, there's still, I think there's still a little bit of work to figure out how that works, but that's the goal anyway. Um, Tom was the guy that made that work. Um, yeah, and so OpenStreetMap is having two events at the end of April. One for people that are just interested in learning more about OpenStreetMap and learning how to map. That's not this weekend, but the weekend after, April 20th and 21st, at, open, at uh, 1871. It's from noon until 6 o'clock or so, depending on how many people show up. So you should come and make them stay later. Um, and what we'll do during that event is work with all these other locations around the world, around the, around the US, to uh, make a really great map of Chicago. And we'll compete with other people around uh, the country to make better edits than them. Um, if you are interested in that, there's a link. There's a, a meetup group that you can uh, RSVP with. And it looks like Dan's including the link in our notes. Thanks, Dan. And then um, if you are technologi technologically inclined, there's an event the week weekend after that, the 27th Whoa. and 28th, uh, where we'll be talking about hacking on OpenStreetMap and making code changes and that sort of thing. There's some people from around the US flying in to work on that. Um, and so, yeah, if you are interested in that, can you walk over here and talk to me? Because I'll show you how to RCP to it. It's not on the meetup, but it's available also. OK. Thank you. And then, like Lola, I would call that out to you. Anybody who's non, like, you're just you're interested in neighborhoods, um, you know a lot about what's going on, you're not super technical, but you want to get involved, this is for you. This event is made for you and, and people who just want to get a mitt and get in the game, we would love to see you there and, 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 and your neighbors from Scarfield Park and, and, and any, you know, neighborhood groups you're involved in, please. This is Corey. He's from Woodmore. Hey, Corey. How are you? I'm Dan. This is Corey. All right. <clears throat> yeah, he's Texas Abbey. All right. We would love to have, well, maybe we can do the, the 
one the other, not the 27th, 28th. But um, so that's I would just call that out. Uh, Keith, that's rude. You want to talk about so talk about this at all? It's yeah. So just <laughs> briefly. So we're um, and there may be people here in this room that are already involved with this. I don't know, um, but just want to make sure the group was aware of it. Um, in September, uh, an exhibition will be mounting um, at Chicago Architecture Foundation. Um, in the lobby space where the big physical model of the city um, sits, um, tracks a lot of people, um, and they're looking to set up a, a one-year exhibition dealing with big data in the city of Chicago, and so especially data that has some sort of relevance to the physical nature of the city in some respect, um, I think would be of great interest. But basically, we're in a in a position of planning where we're looking for ideas of what might be interesting to um, visualize. Um, in different ways within that space for the exhibit. I do have some uh, notes to make on that it, in relation to the whole way the open data movement works. It would be awesome if the exhibit could morph as people like contribute over time. Over yeah, years. absolutely. I think, I mean, we definitely would like to see something that has a dynamic quality to it and it's not just, you know, the same thing week after week after week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and anything that, you know, obviously tells an interesting story. Um, you know, like I said, they attract a lot of people, and obviously from all over the world that, that come to visit Chicago. Um, so I think it'd be a great, a great, you know, venue for for some interesting ideas to be shared. So, um, so I just wanted to check. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can up and running. A little bit. Uh, so uh, I'm also helping out that project a little bit. And uh, hi, I'm Derek here. Uh, and we're talking about making a platform that people can contribute data to, which can then maybe like project onto the model. Uh, so we would take care of like the hard part of projecting onto the model, and we would make it easy for anybody who had some interesting data or some interesting story to tell with data, and you could submit that to uh, this group, and we would then update the model as the year goes on. So yeah, that's definitely the plan. And I'll jump in too, I can be there. I'm perhaps <laughs> on the curator working on this project to see familiar faces. Um, if you want more information, please uh, come with me now and I'm happy to be uh, We're really indebted to this community and you know, folks that have been and you can come to the for uh, developing this project. Okay, awesome. Nobody else wants to help me with this? I can do this too. I'm good. Ingrid, you got Ingrid over here? Mm -hmm. F L H A F T E L. Thank you. Okay. Um, Fiona, I'm Fiona Hi. Morgan. How are you? Hi, I'm Fiona Morgan. I'm a researcher at Duke University and I'm visiting Chicago for a few days. Hey, Fiona. Um, I. Hey! <laughs> hey, it's in North Carolina. <laughs> it was remotely. Um, uh, I'm here for two days because I'm researching a book. I'm co authoring with a big professor named Jay Hamilton. Uh, uh, we are looking at the information lives of low income people and the information needs of low income communities. And mostly it's a scholarly book. I've been looking at scholarly articles from a lot of different disciplines. Um, we're basically trying to see how far. Uh, information can take us in understanding poverty and how people might get out of it. And um, I'm, so I've mostly been doing kind of scholarly research. I'm here in Chicago more as a journalist, which is kind of a treat for me. Um, getting neighborhood tours and talking to people and trying to soak up some sense of place. And um, one of the things that attracted me to Chicago is that it's sort of a site where we're taking over sort of like a poverty, which is more of urban poverty. Um, and not just poverty, but sort of low income and working class neighborhoods as well. It's also um, attracting me because of the work of LIT and uh, the open government community here is very represented. Um, so if you have any thoughts about that, if you want to know more, or if you have any suggestions or things that I should look at, I should talk to you, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. That's pretty good. Excellent. Okay, so we'll, that brings us to the, uh, the bulk of our uh, agenda. And again, uh, let's just, without much ceremony, uh, get to it. I will just mention that I'm really excited. Uh, the way I was in here, as we can see, he was a member since October 26, 2009. Uh, and uh, I finally. I was going to say that a lot, but Ramson was one of the people who, like, when I asked for folks to like, kick in a couple bucks to help pay for the meetup fees before the Smart Chicago was doing it, Ramson was a generous early contributor. <laughs> Damn. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to hear from Ramsden, and without further ado, everybody, it's Ramsden Cannon. Um, 
Hi, everybody. Uh, not sure. Should I stand or sit? What do you guys think? Standing. Standing? All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when, uh, <laughs> when Dan asked me to do this, I had, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Dan, Joe, and uh, all of you for coming um, and open, uh, uh, open Government Chicago for having me. Um, I went through a lot of drafts of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and what uh, Dan said was they were looking for <clears throat> thoughtful critiques. And I thought, I have a lot of critiques. Some of them are even thoughtful. That's very exciting. Um, but uh, the more I thought about it and the more I planned what I wanted to talk about, I realized that I didn't really have critiques as such. I had pleased or um, a wish list, I guess, or uh, yearnings. I don't really know how to put it. but. Um, things that I, I wanted to see that I knew could be done by a group this committed and uh, uh, talented and, and with um, a posture towards uh, civic mindedness. Um, so to that end, I, uh, I prepared some remarks. So I apologize that I'm going to be reading a little bit. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to talk. I ultimately settled on some big picture ideas of open government and and what open government has meant to me back since you know uh, 2009 when I first uh, got in touch with this organization and, and, and in the time I've been following uh, everybody's work um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about those big picture things and um, you know I'm sure some discussion will follow um, in, in October 2010 I wrote an article called uh, modeling an open Chicago and in that article, uh, I spent a lot of time talking about Harold Washington. Now, um, as, as most of or all of you, I'm sure, know, Harold Washington was first elected in 1983. Um, and the type of uh, work that's done in OpenGov Chicago now is, is pretty different from the type of open Chicago that Harold Washington and his campaign had in mind in 1983. Um, you know, they talked about, uh, in, in a lot of the academic literature in particular about that campaign, they talk about the Herald moment or the Washington moment. Um, and the idea was that with the machine politics sort of in retreat and a middlingly popular mayor at the time, um, there was this unique opportunity for community organizations and mass organizations that had active uh, and participatory constituencies um, to assert themselves into the formal institutions of uh, power in, in the city of Chicago. Um, and it was really a coalition of those extant groups that drafted Harold Washington, not vice versa, to lead those organizations into uh, the halls of power. Um, speaking to John Cass in 1987, a spokesman for Mayor Washington said, um, we formed an almost impossible coalition of black businessmen, black nationalists, white liberals, community leaders, and Hispanics. It was like a campaign that started with 10,000 volunteers. And as I'm sure we can all imagine, that's a very potentially transformative organization to go into a political campaign and subsequently grow and to have a real meaningful stake um, in the subsequent government that's formed. Um, and in research that's been done subsequent, particularly in a book called Harold Washington in the neighborhoods, the people who participated in particularly the transition team from the campaign into government talked a lot about how their primary concern was to reform government in such a way that government had to operate based on the participation of those constituent groups that had powered the campaign from its inception. Um, and in the initial stages, in 1983 and 1984, they had quite a bit of success. Now, that sort of was mitigated over time as uh, um, the Washington administration started to increasingly recruit people who already had expertise in specific areas, but more importantly, who had existing power relationships uh, into leadership positions in the administration. Um, and the idea was by bringing those people into government, they could break the gridlock because they weren't locking out people who had held on to power for so long. Um, but by bringing those people into government, ironically, uh, 
you know, by bringing the best and brightest into, into government, this, this particularly beginning around 85 and 86, um, they were sort of imputing moral certainty into those people. The idea being that because you know more, you know best. Um, and that was when there was an increasing disaffection among the constituent groups who got uh, Mayor Washington elected with his administration. But as I was looking through that article and some of the subsequent articles on open government I've written since and uh, you know, books on the subject that uh, I'd used to inform my research, it occurred to me that I never really wrote about data or information, um, or very rarely, and only tangentially. And I think that's a pretty stark difference from a lot of the work that so many of you do, where there is a very serious um, concern with the availability of information and data, uh, how it's structured and how it's made available to the public. Um, so in thinking about why there was that lack of, um, that lack of concern on the part of uh, those who think like me and, and um, who sort of are on a certain side of the open government uh, movement, why there's less of an emphasis on data and more of an emphasis, I suppose, on what we could consider process or relationships. Um, so I started thinking about the word open, and I did the thing you do when you're writing like a valedictorian speech or whatever, and I looked it up in the dictionary. Um, and open has a lot of definitions. It's like run. There's like 40 definitions or something in there. Um, but the first five actually all kind of were applicable, having no barrier, having a barrier but one that permits passage, being free from concealment, not being restricted to a particular class, or being available to make use of. And in the context of government, all of those definitions, they apply to various degrees. Um, but one common thread is that all of them, in the context of government, do have a moral component to them. Um, for example, that last definition to something being made available to make use of, uh, I think that's a definition that, particularly when it comes to data, is very important. We want data to be open in the sense that we want it to be available for people in a way that they can use it. Um, and <coughs> that is essentially a question of utility, of, of the data having utility towards problem solving. But there is a moral component to even just open data. Uh, we weigh the availability of data, for example, against the substantive right of privacy. And we take for granted the substantive right of privacy against which we weigh it, but it's not a static right. It's not found anywhere in the Constitution, and in fact, it didn't really even exist until the 1920s. And it's been in a constant state of evolution since then. It was first formulated in an article, um, which I suggest if you get a chance to read it. Uh, it was published in 1890. Uh, Louis, Louis Brandeis and uh, Sam Warren first came up with the conception of this right of privacy. And when they talked about it, they said there was a special need for it now because of changing technology. They were particularly concerned with cameras and printing presses, the, the ability of newspapers to print photographs. Um, and they said this, this new and terrifying technology had made their, had created a compelling need for a substantive right of privacy. Um, and not only that, but because technology would continue to change, that the right of privacy would need to continue to evolve. But ultimately, privacy and the right to protect it, protects it, and the reason that we consider it such an important right is because we believe because it's tied, I think, to this idea of um, individual autonomy and the dignity of the individual, and it requires vigilant protection by the public, um, and it requires that constant evaluation and redefinition, and that has to be a participatory process if we want to make sure that the substantive right of privacy, for example, can, can, can hold its own against, against the openness, the value that we put in the openness of information and data. Another meaning of, of openness was having no barrier. Now, in the context of government, this type of openness, I think, is closer to the concept that the movement behind the Washington campaign had. They wanted to destroy these. They talked very specifically about tearing down the walls, opening the gates, getting rid of the gatekeepers. They wanted the people, you know, with the capital P, the people to, to really govern themselves. But even people who sort of in, in the abstract support that idea, they would limit it with moral considerations. For example, 
um, a concern for the autonomy of the individual against the, the will of the majority, the acknowledgement that our leaders need honest counsel from experts and from their advisors. Um, <coughs> And, and I think if we looked at all of the definitions of openness and we think about openness, we find that there was some moral dimension that we implicitly uh, attach to or limit those concepts with. Oh, thank you. Um, so I think that given the sort of nebulousness of openness um, and the uncertainty with which we understand that concept, uh, government I thought maybe it was the better place to start. What do we mean when we talk about open government? Well, and, and uh, for those of us who participated in, there was a bit of a discussion on the uh, the listserv about um, uh, companies as countries, and there was some talk of of what it means to be a sovereign. And in, in a democratic republic, of course, uh, the government is the sovereign. It monopolizes coercive power, um, and it, it monopolizes that power based on the consent of the people. And that consent takes various forms. The, the, mo the most sort of obvious one is voting. But voting, actually, interestingly, like privacy, isn't a right that's enshrined in the Constitution. Um, <coughs> speech is, and assembly is, and the right to petition is, and the right of a free press are all in the Constitution. And these are all, interestingly, they're participatory functions. They're things that require conduct by an engaged population. Um, and their substantive rights we have as citizens and their participatory rights. And being free to participate in that public moral argument defines us as citizens. It determines eventually how our government acts. So while it's true that a good government, when we talk about good government, we talk about a government that like gets things done. And we say a better government is one that gets things done well. Um, but given the scope of our sort of substantive rights as citizens, I think the question that we should all think more deeply about is how do we determine what our government gets done well? What is the process by which we as citizens determine what we want our government to get done well? Open government is improving the ability of people to express their citizenship, whether it be in the form of speech or petition for the redress of wrongs or or um, assembly, or these substantive rights that define a, our sort of civic beings. Government services that we like to quantify and analyze, they're just the phenomenon of policy. They're the expression of moral choices that it falls to the public, ultimately, to make in a democratic society. Empowering people to make those choices through better information and fuller participation, I think is the project of open government that was contemplated by the Washington campaign and I think by a significant portion of the open government movement. And what I think I've always really had in mind um, when we talk about uh, open government. And, and I'd like to talk about data and information for a moment. They're, they're definitely a, an important part of it. Um, and they're re most relevant actually ex ante, you know, before the fact, um, as a way to empower people to make policy. but not merely just to consume services. And um, if there's one actually pretty recent example I can think of. There's a site um, that I think that maybe a few people in this room had a hand in uh, developing called schoolcuts.org. Um, it's in, an invaluable uh, piece of civic um, technology. Um, it gives the public information about the ongoing unprecedented Board of Education uh, policy that uh, is going to end up closing uh, approximately 50 or so schools and affecting tens of thousands of uh, Chicago families. Now, the board's plan to choose those scores of schools had been in the works for months. The list of schools was made public around March 19th, and the final utilization report was released around March 6th. Schoolcuts.org, which provides such important information to the public about this process, um, according to their domain registry, was registered on March 12th. Now, giving people data critical to making informed decisions about policy after a policy has been announced is not, to my mind, what we mean when we talk about open government. Insular bureaucracies making decisions of broad public policy rather than narrow technical issues free from substantive public participation cannot be, ultimately, the goal of an open government movement. Um, the open government and open data movements are populated, as <laughs> when looking around this room, we can see it by some 
very dedicated and some of the most dedicated and analytical thinkers about problem solving who are involved in our civic discourse. Um, and School Cuts is just one example of the capacity of those thinkers to think and work collaboratively to produce a final product that's meant as a solution to a problem. And it's precisely that kind of collaborative, analytical, and solution-oriented thinking that is needed at a community level to empower citizens to act as citizens, not just as consumers, to participate in governance and formulating of the moral arguments that guide our government. We have to believe in the creative power of the people working collaboratively with real vested legal authority to actually govern themselves better and more efficiently. Believing in that power, open government movements need to commit as much time to building infrastructure for the moral argument to take place in a meaningful and formal way as they do to building infrastructure for quantitative analysis and dissemination, dissemination of information ex post of major governmental decision making take place. So the question comes up, and I know we're all very de detail oriented people. So what does that mean when we talk about building infrastructure for uh, engaging people in this moral decision making, and there are models available. Some are from the Harold Washington administration itself, the local school council, for example. These were, are mi micro local bodies. They govern schools within certain parameters. Their powers are defined by statute, so they're not just ad hoc. Uh, their composition was designed to involve the public, but also to allow for the expression of expertise. So, for example, teachers and administrators and students have seats on local school councils. They were in an innovation of the Washington administration, and one of the most interesting things about them was their function in creating citywide policy, because the local school councils, which required actual participation, not just once every four year voting, actual participation, it was the local school councils that ultimately determined the composition of the Board of Education. The result was that the board was more democratic, that its composition was determined through a participatory process, not just a democratic process, but a participatory process. Those who had committed time and energy to governance ultimately had a say in the, the creation of policy citywide. We can get examples from other areas of governance. For example, in the land use and planning and design context, um, there's regular use of what are called charrettes. Charrettes um, are meant to arrive at a consensus of, by inclusion of stakeholders, experts, government officials, and the general public. The charrette is a multi-stage process, uh, it, you know, and, and it's, it's meant to make sure that the public isn't blindsided by land use plans, by designs of major public works projects, but to the contrary, that they have a say in how those projects are designed and to ensure that they're harmonious with the community's objectives and with the community's existing physical structure. Now, this doesn't mean that you give the neighbors to a, a particular piece of property, uh, you know, a veto over what gets ultimately implemented, but it does mean that you vest those stakeholders, the public and experts, with certain rights to determine what something is going to look like, and that is a participatory process. In the area of public health, there's the American model of community-based participatory research. Um, W.K. Kellogg Foundation has done a lot of work with uh, what they call CVPR. <clears throat> the community-based participatory research assumes that research and analysis, that research and analysis is best, which is arrived at through participation of the communities and classes of individuals who are being affected by a particular problem or who are being studied uh, for a particular reason. With substantive involvement of the classes of people in the communities being studied, the results tend to be better. Now the deficiencies of these various participatory models, I'm sure we could all think of potential problems that these participatory models of self-governance have, um, tend to be that those who participate don't have vested substantive rights or that the ultimate decision makers are free to disregard what's produced from these, these processes. And a project of open government, therefore, should be to work towards supporting rules, regulations, or, regisl or legislation, excuse me, that formalize ad hoc participatory processes to hold the ultimate decision makers to what is produced through participatory processes, to pass legislation that creates statutory rights of redress 
and vested rights for communities to actually participate in, in this, in not only policy making, but in, in the broader moral questions of what we want our government to do and how we want our communities to operate. I think it's incumbent on civic activists, those of us with access to people in power and with valuable knowledge about the processes of government, to be aware of the power imbalances that characterize the social relations in our communities, and to conceptualize an open government that isn't just restricted to particular classes. In any case, what we undoubtedly know is true, I think, and what's ultimately true at the end of the day, as we all know, the principles that underlie the various approaches here, they can only be improved by wedding them to new te technologies and to streams of data. And that a democratic society that acts efficiently without a moral compass, calibrated to the will of the public, isn't really worth the name democratic. So knowing those two things, a project of open government and a project of open data needs to be not only to bring that, extract that data from unwilling hands, to wed it to new technologies that are always changing, but to figure out a space to allow that data and that technology to bring the people into, into the discussion, to create the space and the infrastructure to make sure that that data is informing people before decisions are made is empowering them in a meaningful way to actually participate in, in their own governance. And it's true that it can be inefficient. Uh, it's true and it's scary. It's what Thomas Jefferson called the boisterous sea of, of liberty. So the bigger point and the ultimate point is that our civic identities and our citizenship are important. They safeguard our individual dignity and they are ultimately the tools that define and protect our personhood. People fought very hard to be recognized as citizens. And being a citizen and the rights, the substantive rights of citizenship are, are very precious. And we can't allow that to become muddled. We have to keep it discreet from our identity as consumers or customers of services. Being a consumer and a customer of services cannot ever be allowed to bleed into being a citizen of a community. The moral judgments of communities on the question of what should government do well simply can't be delegated to technocrats and experts. Entrepreneurial models of change ultimately vest small groups of people with property interests over the mechanics of governance and civic participation. And that, by definition, undermines the ability of communities to make the moral judgments that structure our communities. And for that reason, we need to think long and hard, I think, about what citizenship ultimately means, how we express our, our citizenship, how we can ultimately safeguard our citizenship, and how our movement can empower us in that identity, in that role as citizens. Um, that's all I have prepared. Uh, thank you so much. Um, if, if, I don't know if we have time for two questions. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks. Write down whatever questions and comments you have. We'll put them. Put them in the. Uh, we'll put them in the document. Put them in the document. That would be highly useful if anybody has. So, wow. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rand. Uh, next up, uh, we have Terry. Terry Stika. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, just uh, in terms of, of uh, introducing uh, Terry, it's Terry Kostika. She runs the Citizen Advocacy Center, and Joe and I, uh, we've actually met in the past in, in some journalism stuff with the IRE, the uh, Investigative Reporters and Editors Group. Headline Club. The Headline Well, I was just saying uh, longer term, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then at, uh, when Fernando Diaz uh, put together a FOIA panel at the Headline Club, and, and Joe and I uh, you know, spoke along with Terry, and I was just... Uh, uh, deeply impressed by the work 
that the Citizen Advocacy Center does and how different it is in approach to the way I normally think about these things and and um, and then most importantly you uh, were talking about anti-democratic practices in the state of Illinois. So like, man, I wish I had a job where I talked about anti-democratic state of practices in the state of Illinois. So uh, without further ado, uh, it's Terry Pastika. Thank you. Hi, uh, so my name is Terry. My organization is Citizen Advocacy Center. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, community-based legal organization. Um, we identify ourselves at the, at the center as community lawyers. And uh, a community lawyer is someone who uh, is there to protect uh, public assets and resources. We're a free community law office and we're there to educate people about the process of government decision making, how to impact government decision making, and the different civic uh, engagement tools and laws that are out there to uh, build capacity and strengthen uh, public participation. Um, our mission statement is uh, uh, to build democracy. So. Um, our organization focuses, uh, you know, when I tell people I'm a community lawyer and my mission is to build democracy, they're like, what does that mean? So uh, on a daily basis in my office, we work on two spectrums. On the one hand, we work with um, grassroots uh, community groups to help people address local public policy issues that um, inevitably, in helping people kind of navigate the red tape of um, dealing with local government policy issues, they hit some kind of anti-democratic barrier. And we help them figure out how to knock that barrier down, uh, replace it with good policies, um, file lawsuits if you have to, use access to the ballot, essentially um, the different mechanisms that allow people to become engaged and effective participants. And then on the other side, we work with government entities to develop policies. So we're kind of constantly dealing with this balance balance issue. So um, the beginning of my day often starts with someone calling me saying, Terry, can they insert any kind of government entity do that? Insert sure. just about any kind of behavior that you can think of. And to give you um, some context here, I've had someone call and say, Terry, can a mayor remove all the chairs from the city council um, the day of a city council meeting? So you know nobody has a place to sit. Or can a public official um, uh, escort someone out of a finance committee meeting for rolling their eyes in dis dis dissent, which actually happened? Or how about this? Can a county, because you know all the land, it's a land use issue and it's just completely built out and there's no more places for religious institutions, pass uh, a change to their zoning code that no longer allows places of assembly in unincorporated residential areas. And when you talk about data, when we made a FOIA request to, to the government body to say, what kind of places are asking for um, permits to build right, you know, places of assembly? What a shock. They're religious institutions. When did this um, proposal come up? What a shock. After several mosques have put in permits to uh, set up places of assembly in unincorporated areas. Um, what else? Oh, this is a good one. Um, what happens, can a, can a government body that has a, a process by which you get a protest permit, can they only require some people to have to go through that process and not others? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, good question. Right? <laughs> so this is kind of the context in which I work. And um, in helping people uh, understand a variety of things, we help, so they come to me and they Say all these and all these things are actual intakes that that we've worked on. Um, so we help number one figure out information. What information do you need to be <coughs> educated about this issue? And um, a lot of times we use the Freedom of Information Act. We use the Open Meetings Act law. We use um, information that isn't necessarily government held, um, but it's educating yourself about ordinances and statutes. So information is key combined with understanding the process by which government decision making happens, understanding who gets you the yes vote. Are you talking about a public official or are you talking about a staff person that's been there for 30 years who really is the gatekeeper? We talk about um, how do you use different media sources, how do you build coalition, and then my favorite 
how do you use various First Amendment activities? And we help people put all of those elements together to make a difference. So when Dan uh, was educating me about what this group does, I became very excited because one of the problems that public policy people deal with, which is what I do, combination of community organizing and public policy, is that I think our weakness in dealing with open government is our um, lack of savviness around how to use information and how to aggregate it. So, for example, I can't. I was just talking to somebody in the room uh, here. I have. I'm dealing with a community issue with a, a government body who was talking about in closed session whether to build a building four or six stories high, and they, they did a bunch of stuff that they shouldn't do. And I made a FOIA request to the government body saying, I want to know everything about this project that's been going on for the last four years. Just give me everything. And they did. And it was over 800 pages of documents. So this weekend, I spent you know, the entire weekend going page by page, reading through it. And I just thought, oh my god, there's got to be a better way. This, this is just, I know the information that I'm looking for. I know what I'm trying to achieve. Um, but the mechanism is archaic. And so um, I'm really happy to listen and learn from all of you. Um, so what else? So the other thing my organization does is once we work at the grassroots level with individuals to deal with a local public policy issue, more often than not, the barrier that we're trying to knock down is rooted in a state law. So then that elevates the work that we're doing to a statewide level. So all of our grassroots um, advocacy ends up in a statewide campaign around various public policy issues, um, you know, because it, it deals with um, uh, an issue related to the Freedom of Information Act, related to information that's accessible. It relates to um, land use ordinances regarding the zoning process. It relates to um, the tax increment financing statute and issues related to there. So the areas of practice that I work on tend to be um, TIF, issues with home rule, a lot of election law, municipal law, school law, um, even and a lot of First Amendment. You know, I don't know how many communities I've gone into and I've told them you can't make a public comment policy that says people can't show up and say not nice things to you. You know, people have a First Amendment right not to be nice. You know, I say that a lot. Um, I had one government body that banned uh, political satire during public comments, which I thought was just crazy. So, um, so I'm very excited to hear uh, more about how our organization or groups like us can more, can do more around um, open data, and because it, it is um, a great opportunity to uh, work with people, uh, you know, for example, I have an a individual that came to me recently and said the tax assessment process um, is absolutely flawed because there is no um, formulaic method by which tax assessment happens. When you do um, an analysis of it out in, the, in DuPage County and I know in Lake County and you go and talk to the tax assessors and you say, how do you assess property? You know, it, it turns out to be kind of like the Supreme Court in uh, uh, obscenity, you know it when you see it. That's pretty much what tax assessment is in the western suburbs and in deciding values. Well, you know, based on our experience, we know what property values are worth, we know what homes are worth. And when people go through the tax assessment um, process and challenging their and appealing, it's an extraordinarily biased system in favor of the government entity, and that is a ripe area for uh, open data um, opportunities to combine these flaws in public policy, these flaws in the laws, combined with let's document how biased the system is and, and fix a lot of these problems. I was only asked to talk 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep it, keep it pretty short. But um, the, another example um, that I want to give is Derek, who talked earlier. I'm really excited because um, a lot of the colleagues that I work with um, on our statewide issues involve great organizations like Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, Per Common Cause, Latino Policy Forum. We're getting together and we're doing a redistricting project. And we are working with Derek to essentially educate people about the redistricting process and, and mapping. And um, as you know, it's hard to engage people 
on uh, redistricting issues because, as a journalist told me, it's just not sexy. And so we're like, how do you make redistricting sexy? Well, then we met Derek, and Derek's helping us make it sexy. And, the, and we're doing that by combining our policy understanding and the data that we've gathered related to the mapping process, and he's helping us overlay various maps to show people how the redistricting process in Illinois is extraordinarily arbitrary and protects incumbency. And so I think, um, at least from my educational uh, standpoint, it's been a really good opportunity to understand how can this community combine with the community that I'm in to really do some amazing things. So I look forward to talking and learning. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next we've got Mike. Uh, Stringer, who uh, runs uh, Datascope Analytics, I think uh, a lot of us know him, know him and love him as uh, the dude who runs uh, Data Science Chicago meetup. And without further ado, I'll be your dude on the uh, next place. How about that? Okay. Uh, what am I doing here? How does one? Is that good enough? Yeah, it's fine. Right. The slides are handy. Yeah, view. View menu. There you go. There we go. Oh, my. That's the oh, yeah, baby. You'll <laughs> <It's in that laughs> do. All right, so, so thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Stringer. Uh, I'm going to give my, my version here of a critique of open government and from the introduction, all the things that I'm involved with have the word data in them. So. <laughs> I guess you can tell that I'm kind of coming at it from the data side. Uh, and, and actually, uh, kind of like Ramzan, it's uh, less of a critique than it is kind of uh, maybe there's part critique, but it's also part kind of plea or suggestion, something that I think may be helpful for our community. Um, one thing to point out is, is really what I'm really talking about is kind of geared towards data, not so much open government in general. And also, I think that uh, in terms of open data, this actually could be extended uh, to whatever adjective you want to insert in front of data there. Uh, everything that you read about big data, um, there's a new one. I've been hearing a lot of people talking about long data. So whatever your preferred adjective is, uh, this is a critique that's that's more along the lines of just kind of the approach that we're taking when using data to do things that are useful. Uh, so just to kind of summarize my naive uh, view of the open government model here in Chicago, uh, on one hand we've got the government who's kind of opening up the data. So their role is more kind of let's make the data open. Uh, kind of like a, I don't know, wholesaler, something like that, uh, where it's just kind of like, we're, we're going to put it out there, and we're going to see what happens. We want to try to engage the community, get people who are civically engaged to do useful stuff with it. So then on the other hand, there's the civically engaged people uh, whose task is it now. There's all this really awesome data that the, that People across the across the world, across the country, especially here in, in Chicago, are doing a great job at making available. <coughs> now you've just got to do something useful with it. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about what we, and by we I mean the, the citizens who want to do something useful with this open data, how we can approach that. So I'm going to make a, a very, very broad generalization about a few common patterns that we use when using data. So this first one, if you can read this, is asking kind of what can we do with this data? So go browsing around, you hear some new data set is released, and you ask the question, what can we do with this? So you start with, you got some, some really cool new data set that's available on the data portal. You go download it, and you think, all right, what can I do with this? So you use the data to formulate some sort of problem that you want to solve. And then you go, you solve it somehow. And maybe if you're trying to influence policy, 
you have to communicate that to somebody who's actually in charge of influencing policy. Uh, it could also be that communicating it is more uh, a function like where you're trying to make the information available to the general public. Maybe that's what you mean by communication. But there's just kind of this general picture of what can we do with this data. Uh, oh. All right, so then, then there's kind of another pattern, which is, all right, this data, it's in spreadsheets. It's, uh, you have to be a computer to really go through and read this. Let's just make, let's do something visual. Let's visualize this. Let's make an interface that lets anybody explore this data. So it's just kind of like, all right, we've got the raw source coming in. Let's make it beautiful. Let's make it fun. Let's make it's something where people can explore. Uh, a particular subset of that is uh, putting, it, putting it on a map. <laughs> so it doesn't seem like maybe there are many Portlandia fans here. Right. But uh, it's kind of like you've got some data, put it on a map. You put maps, you put things on maps. So that's kind of a particular subset. And with the data is applying tools. It's really hard. And, and I know this. I, I put up that, uh, we put things on maps, uh, but I do that all the time. I'll put things on maps. I'm guilty of putting things on maps. The reason that, it, it, the reason that I do that and that I think anybody does it is that there are lots of tools for putting things on maps. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with maps, but it's just really easy to do. And when you're starting with data that usually is kind of geographical, you're like, I'm going to put this on a map. And a lot of times, that's where it ends. And so starting with the data encourages this kind of data-centric, I'm going to just look at this data, figure out a problem based on this data uh, way of doing things. So that's the critique. And the suggestion for what we can do is to take, take these common patterns and kind of switch it around. Maybe switch around the way that we think about data. So instead of thinking about data as the way that we define problems, we can start thinking about it as a resource, as an increasingly abundant resource that's amazingly powerful as part of a solution to interesting problems or useful problems or problems that have societal importance. So you just switch this around, and you start with the problem, and you think about data as a particular resource, <coughs> then all of a sudden, things change with the way that you think about the problem. Uh, and just like starting with data encourages some behaviors, I think that this encourages a few types of behavior. So by starting with the problem and not even thinking about kind of the resources that are available, you actually, it encourages you to think about the important problems. So you don't think about the low-hanging fruit problems or the easy-to-apply tools to problems. You start thinking about the important problems. So it, it encourages that. It also encourages you to think about all the resources that might be available. So in particular, talking to humans. Uh, generally, for important problems, people have thought about them a lot. You think about them all the time. Uh, <coughs> Terry, uh, Terry, right? Mm -hmm. Your group uh, thinks about problems, and you say they, 
you generally like you have trouble with the data part, but you you really know what the problems are that people are facing. If you start by thinking about the problem and working with people like Terry, then you get a much more uh, uh, holistic view of of what you can actually do to make a real impact, not just put it on a map, but make a real impact. And and another thing that it encourages is to uh, to actually bring in more data. So when you're thinking about resources that you have, maybe you bring in a few of the stuff from the from the city data portal. Maybe you bring in some stuff that's not in the city data portal. Maybe you work with somebody that's somewhere totally different that has something that can be used as a little clue to help you solve this problem. So the, the kind of not starting with the data and instead starting with the problem is kind of a plea. Uh, to the community of, of people that are kind of doing things with, with open data. And to kind of summarize, uh, this process is, is kind of stolen from the design community. So this is, this is really kind of how the design community thinks about problems. And one of the things that they emphasize is really, uh, they emphasize that to empathize with uh, who you're building things for? Who? Is, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to communicate somebody uh, something to a policymaker? Uh, this policymaker probably doesn't care very much about data. How are you going to communicate that? Don't show them graphs that are very complex. Maybe not even maps. Uh, how can you communicate it? So empathize with who you're designing for. If it's the general public or if it's a policymaker, start from there. Then think about how to use data as a resource. So that's that's basically it. Uh, data is not the solution in itself. It's a resource. If we start thinking about it that way, I think we can start making real impact. And, and actually, I would add that I think that we have an awesome opportunity. I think there aren't very many places that, that have the type of data that we have in the city here, in Chicago. And I think. There aren't very many people. I, I, I think that this, like I said at the start, it's not an open data issue. This is an issue within the broader technological context that data is, is growing like crazy. It's not just in governments. It's everywhere. And everybody is facing this challenge of how do we use this. And uh, this, this issue of starting with the data, it's kind of the first attempt that I think we as a community have made and to really start doing really impactful things across uh, in government and society. If we start thinking about using data as a resource, I think that's when we can really start to see uh, real impact. So that's it. Thanks. Joe, do you want to maybe lead us in the discussion? Yeah, questions? Down below, brother. There you go. That's it. Whoa. Ah. Let there be light. Right. Let's, let's oh. I'm going to get more water. <coughs> um, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, I guess the first thing I was thinking about is, in a sense, they're three very different sort of fields or presentations. I'm wondering if any of you have reactions to each other's comments or thoughts, and, and then definitely want to open up to questions more broadly. Does anyone immediately, uh, or a panel, sort of see a dovetail that maybe you weren't expecting until you saw what your counterparts brought up? Okay. Well, I mean, this, Mike and I were talking you know, when we got started that I just find it interesting that, that his critique is that you start with the data and then you try and think of the problem, and it's completely back the opposite for us. We think we have the problem in front of us, and we're trying to figure out what data do we need. And then oftentimes it's a data dump, and we have to figure out what relevant data do we need to apply it to the problem. And so that that was really interesting. Right. It's really easy to just kind of start from what you have in front of you. I think Mike made some great points about that from someone who's gone down that road before myself. Uh, questions from the field? Anyone inspired to? Jerry. I find myself a little disappointed that we're not talking about very different kinds of things. Because what I what I think 
is our biggest problem is that we can't adequately influence the processes of government. I mean, it was touched on in the intro, but how it's like how do we as a community decide what is the most important? And it's not about data or solutions even. It's about how we come together as human beings and decide what to do. And the processes of government are dominated by powerful organizations that are top-down organized. And our views are frankly not very important. You know, and you know, I, I'm not sure what to do about it anymore. You know, I mean, we have millions of people out of work. I mean, I, I'm a 30, 30 some year experienced technical person, MIT degree, and it's very difficult to find work in this market. You know, I, I find I find that I'm being age discriminated against because I'm not a kid anymore. And this is all about the processes we design. Well, I think this is a good opportunity to, and I think Ramson actually kind of set up that conversation to yeah. say that open government is about participation. And you're right that participation um, is not necessarily currently being addressed by technology or something, but maybe there are ways to. Just, any people have reactions to that, ideas for uh, places to, to fulcrum to put the lever in? I feel like right. there's a, a divide between the nerds and the people that have the problems. And I think that there's a lot of people here that uh, have the technical know-how and know where to find data, but they're not being connected with the people that have the problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think the way that you're, the critique was that we, there, the people that are putting out the apps right now are starting with data and saying, how can, what can I do with this data? And, and from your perspective, you have a problem, and how can we find data to solve the problem? I think there's just somebody's like missing, and we just need to match those things up, and everybody will be happy. <laughs> so you know. just briefly, um, you know, one of the things that, that I hope that this group would do from the very beginning would be to start to make a forum for those people to meet. Yeah. I think that has been happening. Exactly. It's slow and, and gradual, and it's always evolving. And just another, it's certainly not a cure-all, but if anyone's here who doesn't yet know about the Tuesday night open government hack nights that um, Derek and Juan and a whole bunch of other people who are here help to keep happening, it's a great place for people to actually like get together head-to-head. -head. If you've got problems, people come to that who have skills and are interested in using them but don't know what to do, and it's a place that's at 1871 every Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Um, it's, it's one way to start bridging that gap. It's, I'm sure it's not the only one, but it's one start. Uh, gentleman over here had a hand raised. I was going to say, I noticed from your website that you don't have an IT department. I am the uh, IT department. <laughs> no, we don't, I mean, we're a small nonprofit. We've been around 20 years. And, uh, you know, all of our IT is, uh, you know, comes from our, yeah, it's homegrown and it comes from our volunteers. But to your point about, you know, participate, participation, I mean, that. You know, Ellen, I don't have to tell this group, Illinois has got problems, man. You know, I mean, a lot of the times the groups that we work with, they succeed in a campaign because they've effectively combined all these things that, you know, data and, you know, action and, and, and organizing and political pressure. And then oftentimes what is very routine is that the powers that be end up changing the rules of the game so the mechanism by which the community group was successful the first time is annihilated, and they can't use that same formula again. And so we constantly have this, you know, the, 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 the system is set up to intentionally shut people out at various levels, all the way from, you know, local electoral boards that won't let people get on the ballot in your school board, and those school board members are the ones who go to the county board and then who go up to the general assembly. And if we don't start changing the culture of expectations at the local level, there's, well, you guys know the problems. Yeah, I think we have to re-engineer the processes of government from the ground up. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think the only way that's going to happen is if we can make a, a call for participation, and we start making a goal in our whole country with, like, 100% voter community. Participation, 100% registration. We stop being satisfied with with piecemeal solutions to, to forces that don't want people to vote. You know, I mean, there's corporate forces that don't want people to vote. 
we have ALEC going around making that model legislation. What do we have in defense of that? Mm -hmm. Um, of course, uh, uh, Mike Stringer, I thought, I thought he really was involved in a lot of stuff you were saying. Um, and I thought about the political question, who are you accountable to? And uh, uh, my feeling is a lot of the folks doing this work, um, they're accountable to their thesis advisor because they're in an MBA program. Or they're accountable to a group of peers who are of similar mindset and often very similar demographically in terms of age and uh, background. And I feel like... Um, this appeal of data has to do with the fact that if what you're accountable to is abstract if data, if there's a right solution, it's very easy to go down the slope of uh, feeling like what people want, what constituencies want, is rendered illegitimate because it doesn't line up with the way you interpret the numbers and what the data seems to be saying. I just feel like what the data seems to be saying is so subjective, it goes through such a lens of who's the one doing the interpreting. And a lot of times, the people doing the interpreting are the people that will eventually hire people who like to play with data, which is to say large corporations, academic departments, the upper echelons of government policymaking community. And I don't know if I trust that community, even if the people they hire are wonderful, good people. Um, you know, oh. Oh, sorry. Exactly. I'm sorry. Just Two, two points on that, just real quickly. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I, I touched on it a little bit, but this idea of community-based participatory research is used a lot in public health. And it's, there's been actually like a lot of serious academic work done on developing this, this model of, of research. And, and essentially it says you find a community that is identified as, as having, uh, you know, as being troubled or as having particular problems that it faces, and then you go in and you, to avoid the, the levels of abstraction, you actually work with the community to identify the problems, what they think the solutions are, um, and you know the, the particular challenges that might not be uh, aware that they might not be aware of looking at it from the outside. Um, and I think that ha would help you identify the problem, like Mike was saying, um, at the outset that you then need the data to to solve. You know what I mean? Um, and that that. It's that process you want to go through, I think, that helps identify what the problem is that you can then, you know, force government or whatever parties are involved to release the data that you could then use to fashion a proper solution. But, but um, you know, the problem, identifying the problem needs to emanate from a process like that. <laughs> So, uh, problem definition aside, uh, I always find it fascinating the way that people actually describe data depending on how they're presenting and what point they want to get across. But one thing that tends not to come up is that um, data itself is the end product of a process. Right? And so, the process by which that data is collected has intent. Um, people typically are, it's either the, the, the result of some other activity that they're uh, embarking on, or if it is a really, really intentionally um, created data set, you know, that there's something that somebody's looking for. Um, and so when you actually talk about what the data set is useful for, um, you have to keep the process that generated it in mind. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's, um, when you talk about the sorts of analyses that you can actually do off of the data set, you know, that, that's something that you have to think about. I, I don't think it's the case where data is uh, neutral in that sense, um, and uh, as well as the fact that um, uh, one of the things that you can do, though, once you do understand what process to produce your data set and what things that um, that data set is capable of, you can actually argue about the analysis. The major problem, though, is um, uh, who is actually capable of spending the time to understand the data set and what the nuances are, and that's really where the, the hard part is, and that's where you do need nerds who either um, understand the domain that you're operating within, or you need to have somebody uh, sort of facilitate with a uh, domain uh, expert um, in order to be able to figure out what you can actually say with the data set. And so, you know, it's definitely true that um, when you have uh, people who want to arrive at a conclusion regardless of what the facts actually are, you can use data sets to lie about all sorts of stuff. But that's the point at which you really need to be able to say, no, that data set does not do that, right? Um, and that's really where um, you know engagement in the analyses uh, and being able to um, uh, uh, talk about uh, um, 
what sorts of things people care about, but also what sorts of things you can say from the data set is really vitally important. Um, and hoping, you know, I, and you know, that's sort of a contribution to um, this last presentation, but that was also excellent. You need to think about you know how the data actually fits into the whole here. Thank you. Um, well, just briefly, another thing that I wanted to bring up in reference to sort of the uh, local aspect. One of the very earliest things before. We had an uh, administration that was dazzling us with data releases and candy. Um, but this group was pretty young, and we were like, well, what can we do? What, like, what is a thing that Open Government Chicago can do that's productive? One of the ideas that came up that, um, that was really great that never really got traction, but I think it still um, is really interesting and kind of dovetails nicely with some of the things Rams presented, was the idea that we as a group or some members of the group would try and start to facilitate applying technology to some of the local participatory bodies that are in our city. So people would go engage with their local school councils and suggest a way the local school council could actually be more effective with technology and to maybe prototype a tool that could then be, as, as it found its level, spread around to all the local school councils in the whole city, originating from just one or two where that was happening. Or to go to CAPS meetings and to actually like cover them and report back to people what's happening and start to help to understand how to integrate the interest of technology, data, communication with these processes that are already in place and have been for a while. My name is Corey. Um, one of the things I actually experienced, uh, I'm a Unix engineer. I've been programming Unix for 16 years. So one of the things I experienced living in uh, Woodlawn community is that there's a ton of data at the bottom, but people actually get it wrong. I actually just went to uh, schoolcuts.org and it got it wrong about FISC. FISC isn't closing. It's actually, I mean, Sexton isn't closing. FISC has been collapsed into Sexton. So, I mean, we can collect all the data we want, but if the people that manipulate the data actually get it wrong, there's going to be a huge, ginormous problem. A lot of people say, well, African American community, they don't really talk about crime. It's just, this barrier of science. That's a lie. I mean, you go to the CAPS meetings, you get 4,700 calls for service and 18 people arrested. So the community is screaming out for help, but they're running into this huge barrier when it, when it comes to people providing a service. So, I mean, as, a, as an engineer and a programmer, I'm at the ground level collecting this data and trying to find a way to present it. But when I go to people that actually provide the service, we run into a ginormous wall that we just cannot get around. And I'm a libertarian in philosophy, so I, I got to try to find a way, a real creative way of getting around it by dealing with the people there and some of the constructs that have been there for a very long time. So as we collect this data, we really need to start figuring out the people at the ground, they really need help. And the help that they're asking for, they're really just asking somebody to push the administrator layer to the side and come down with the direct services to them. And that's something that I hope that some people get and try to get into these communities to help these guys because they're screaming, but just they're hitting the glass ceiling and their voices are just not getting beyond that. Something I kept thinking when I was watching your slides, especially at the end, um, designing for um, the engineering for the problem. Uh, from the design world, is this kind of new territory for me, besides a little bit of dabbling with the Free Software Foundation? But a phrase that we use a lot is, if you're designing to solve a problem, you're always stuck behind the next problem, whatever that is, whether it's not using your data correctly or you know, messing up some kind of UX, whatever it is, you're stuck behind a problem. So kind of as my first foray into the open government world, I'm just kind of curious, what are the um, what are the barriers to working with designers and working with people uh, who focus primarily on the people first? Design for psychology and how people make decisions, organize information, and then decide where the problems are and what that is to use. Um, so I guess it's just kind of an opening question to the group is what are the barriers? Why do you have to you know, steal from designers? I'm here, so that's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Yeah. But I, I thought all the presentations were wonderful. It's really nice. It's really exciting to see this sort of stuff. Well, uh, us designers have been involved in some data stuff for a long time, five years in my case. These two people over here, Josh and Elna, are working on school cuts. I'm working on school cuts. I don't know if there are any other school cut people here. On the, on the Stockton question, you guys can. Stockton's actually, according to CPS, Stockton's closing, I think, in. Sex, yeah. So, sex in, yeah. So Sexton is closing, and Fisk is relocated to Sexton's building, right. which actually brings me. Um, yeah, but, but that's that's technically untrue. Fisk, principal, is moving to Sexton. So Sexton, I mean, I mean, I live like right around the corner, and we had a meeting there. But so Sexton is losing the principal. Fisk principal is moving to Sexton, and the hundred and 
85 students that are in FISC right now are being collapsed into sex. So Sessman was just redid like a year ago. So they put like millions of dollars into redoing the school. And it's actually a pretty beautiful school too. So I, exactly what you said, put it in the comments, please. I mean, that's that's something that, so school class was mentioned a couple of times, and I'm glad that it's starting to create a discussion, but we're not here to create anything in a vacuum. You know, we need, that's exactly why there's a comment section at the bottom, tell us if the data is wrong. And a little bit of a backstory. Some of the data on there was literally hand entered. So, so while I firmly believe that we don't need to start from the data to address the solution, but if we want to answer questions that the data isn't granular enough or isn't accessible enough, that's going to affect our work as well. So I think this, we, none of these issues are independent of each other. There's process that's involved. As also, we have to think about if we op if if we really want a participatory government, we have to think about. Is it naive to think that? every single person out there is just gung-ho. If we just gave them a way to get involved, they would. Apathy is a real issue, and I think trying to uh, pretend that if we just made the right tool or if we had the right technology or if we look at the, right, the problem the right way, then solve. there are some problems that aren't going to be solved with technology. But I'm glad. I think you should, you know, if you see more things, that that's the whole purpose of putting the data out there so we can get information like that that isn't available on the CPS website right now. And, and, and to continue the school cuts, we want to... CPS has promised that every kid will go to a better school, but they're not going to, <coughs> they do track where the kids go, but they're not going to release any of that data. They won't even really, they, I don't think they'll do their own internal studies. They, they won't release it to uh, Bob Berger, who, who just left at Chapin Hall, who does this kind of study. We were just talking about it a few minutes ago. So there'll be no proof whether the kids went to to a better school in, in, from the little kind of community service studies I've seen between 50 and 70 percent of the kids actually end up going to another school, not to the receiving school. So we have to not only get data, we, we've had, we, one night we worked from 5 in the evening to 4 o'clock in the morning, about six of us online sharing a Google spreadsheet, hand entering data from images and from uh, uh, PDFs just because the data, CPS didn't make the data available. So we start with stories, things we want to say. We, we take a design. We all know I actually spent a fair amount of time interviewing teachers, students, parents, trying to figure out what the issues were. And, and that's we're getting huge response. Tens of thousands of, of views of the, of the pages, you know, the individual school pages. People today were printing out pages from the site, taking them to the school meetings, king meetings, and holding them up and, and uh, you know, saying, well, what you say on stage is not what, you know. We're, but anyway, if we don't get the granular data that actually tests whether they actually kept the promises they're making, it's kind of meaningless. So we need to be pressuring people like CPS to provide that data. And that's what Joe and and Dan and I have been doing for years. We, 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 we advocated for open data, and then we finally got some of it from the manual administration. Then we had to do something with it. It's a continually evolving. So now we have a CPS. We have Dorothy Brown support system. Won't give in company data. You know, all this it's going to be plenty of more uh, doors to knock on. So but yeah. to go back to where uh, Paul started, it's, it is true that School Cuts is an example of a site that was built from a design perspective. But there are still gaps, and there are cases where um, and it goes back to just making the introductions. Terry didn't know that we existed collectively until very recently. And this group has a, a it's just very easy for us to hang out together and say, hey, this is neat. And you know, we did this trick with that data, or this tool is very interesting. And it's not that that's hollow and without merit, but it is also true that, and this is, you know, even Smart Chicago uh, has some specific initiatives to get out into the um, neighborhoods and to connect with people at the street. There are lots and lots of ways where it can happen, but the thing is it hasn't happened yet. And so people who recognize um, that there's needs need to sometimes maybe cross uh, bridges or barriers that are a little bit wider than what's right in front of us to make those connections. Yeah, can, I, can I address that uh, reaching the neighborhoods, reaching people in the neighborhoods? And Patrick Berry, I work for this Chicago. And uh, first of all, congratulations to all three of the speakers who in different ways uh, referenced this interesting um, concept that Mike put into words, talking to humans. <laughs> Good 
that's a good place to start. Susanna Vasquez, is the executive director of RISC, as many of you know, she presented a uh, night open golf challenge idea to create community processes that would then bring ideas, bring problems to the tech community in Chicago. She made it to semifinalists in, uh, in that, that night challenge uh, last week. And she will be speaking next Tuesday night at the Open Golf, unless something changes. So uh, if you wanted to learn more about her ideas on how you organize neighborhoods around the problem, and then that neighborhood has sufficient language and has sufficient background to come to this group and say, this is what we need to do. We think these data sets are the ones we need. We recognize that there's some problems with this other data set because we have local knowledge of it. And then you can start making some headway because you combine local knowledge with technical knowledge. So Susanna's going to talk more about that next week, but I think that's it's a big challenge that we could work close to. Once again, those Open Gov Hack Nights happen at 1871 at the Merchandise Mart on Tuesday nights, and I think they announce them every week on the Open Gov Google group, right? That's where I get that email. Yeah. So if you sign up for our Google group, uh, then you'll be reminded, but they're pretty consistent. Can I make a quick plug just in general for that one? We've got some folks coming in from Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and Milwaukee who have also received broadband technology opportunity program grants to expand public access to technology and encourage and get people adopting broadband access at home. And they're going to be here and they're going to come to that same session that Patrick was talking about. And I think we're going to get them to engage and talk a little bit about what they're doing in their communities as well. So it might be really useful for folks to hear what's going on in other cities and how that compares to Chicago. You're going to need a bigger room. Yeah, that's right. Also, please take notes on this. Do you guys uh, like to mention uh, the presentation? Mr. Cameraman here <laughs> On the blog, oh, yeah. every week. And now that we have good camera, I'll uh, live stream and record that one, too. Cool. Uh, my name is Ali Ramos. I'm actually a reporter with WBZ. Um, some of the stuff I've done so far, some of you guys might have seen the article I did, uh, mostly here. <laughs> um, I, so I've, I'm from Chicago, born and raised, native, uniform. Uh, and one of the things I will say is uh, my critique of the way media handles that. And uh, not naming names, and I know this probably be on YouTube, so uh, I've noticed that in particular, especially since Homicide Speak last year, the way that Homicide data was a little depressing. Um, people were quick to map it out. Uh, people could tally it, and it's it's sort of read day to day like I was reading baseball stats instead of people in neighborhoods that I was in as a kid getting shot and killed. And I would say that that's a media critique that should really be when people are sort of inclined to make apps. So for people that don't know the way the news websites work, you make a proprietary data visualization that traffic spikes the roof. Uh, one of the things I publish is the interactive gang map, which is a CPD's thing. And it's single-handedly the most trafficked item on our website for a year. And it still shows up in the top 10 lists every day. Um, that was not my intention, but that's what happens. And when it comes to data visualizations, interactive charts, stuff like that, they come, they're blockbuster traffic news websites, so they're very proprietary about the source files that they go into making them. So I get a little upset when people are really jazzed about putting it on a map, and then it's sort of done dispassionately. And I will say that's a big critique that I have with some of the media organizations when they actually do stuff like that. It's like you're reading baseball stats or violence in Chicago, and let's see what the, head, the, the body count is today. And that's not probably, probably not the right way to go about it. Um, the other thing is that a lot of journalists, it's not necessarily a technical barrier, although that does exist, are very su suspect of the data they get from an entity which, in their day to day, they known to apply to their face on things. Um, to get the gang map files, I had to FOIA it and then go to the state's attorney's office just to get the file. Mm. They gave it to me in a PDF, and I spent four weeks on Google Earth drawing it out. <laughs> uh, they weren't GIS files, even though they knew what those were. Uh, I did the ward remap process, and the three different offices were having map files, which were done by GIS specialists, mm -hmm. and we had to get them from each of the caucuses and then post them online. Whereas that there's no requirement, no ordinance saying that they have to post an electronic map online, make it accessible to the public, mm -hmm. and then allow for a certain amount of time of debate before they actually did it. They they rejiggered that map, published it, signed it into law, and then a few months later, 58 pages of map correction. Mm -hmm. Whereas anybody
anybody who looked at the ordinance that was trying to draw it out in the weekend with a bottle of wine like I was would know <laughs> that there were directional errors, that there were 58 pages of corrections done to a map that our alderman signed into law, some of which also signed in our parking area. Mm -hmm. But there's that barrier where there's no actual legislation requirement on data. There's an executive order, but there's no, no legislation saying that that there, these agencies are required to report this particular da data. I work a lot with the crime data set, which I did stories on marijuana arrests and stuff like that. There's n they don't uh, they, they don't list uh, offender or victim info, particularly about age, race. Uh, when it comes to the homicide data, you actually have to reconcile it with the uh, medical examiner's office, just to sort of tie those locations together. Where you have like location data from the CPD, and you have sex. Uh, age and race and name from the medical examiner, which sometimes you can only get at 5 o'clock in the morning. Go figure. <laughs> but those are my questions. Thank you. Real quick, to, I want to point out to everybody, I invite you to notice how much we talk about data here without talking about what data is. And it's especially good to follow up to what he's saying because he's going into detail about some specific kinds of data and how they work and don't work. And, and this is deeply technological design level stuff, but you know how do we have a public debate on stuff that's deep in the arcania of, of, of how we do technology? And, and we have the government people who are actually actively trying to keep us from, from being able to develop good public data. You know, and I mean, I think you know you, your first presentation we talked about openness, and I see so so much opposition to openness in the process of government that, that I wonder, you know, what does that word even mean? You know, you defined it from the beginning. It, it, it no longer is meaningful. It's still better than it was five years ago. No kidding. Because of the work these guys are doing, all you guys, yeah. Congratulations to all the work you're doing. Um, I guess uh, an observation to uh, your comment about uh, how information is presented and how it's how useful it is, is there is oftentimes a question of do you uh, create data for presentation or do you create data so that's easy to use? And that that dichotomy oftentimes there's a gap to. And data that's easy to easy to present that's presentable is very difficult to use in a technology platform. So it's a question of what is the priority is to provide something that you can that someone can <coughs> or something that can be Combine better information and you just create more value from from that data. I guess uh, what what I was at what well, the question I had when when we went through the presentation was what can the city, what can the state, what can the federal government do uh, differently that differently specifically than they're currently doing to uh, provide the information that is needed to help you uh, advance your goals? If aside from providing perhaps more focused data or focused information, what, what can be done differently about processing, about how the interface is doing? Um, I kind of wanted to give some in, because you're right, the way they released the information on about the ward map, when they proposed it in the paragraph format, that was crap. But if in sort of the data teams, the city's data team defense, y'all had to wait until they passed the ordinance before y'all could start actually mapping that stuff out. Correct? Or, uh, no, no, I think they make the maps with GIS data. I mean, but when they're deciding or the, how they want to be, they're using technology, and then the historical method for defining things requires them to reverse engineer from a technological map to a prose description. Um, they were, but they were coming in, like if you read the description, which was over 100 pages long, like one board boundary was five pages long, and they would make reference to a, a tiger line ID, ID ordinance, which if you're a layman, like, not even a layman, you wouldn't even, like, you would have no reason to go into the census tract, like, coordinate system, try to figure out what, like, the alley, and then go to a railroad track that has since been, like, how to use for, like, 40 years. And then it goes through some oh, random book in the middle of the highway. And, and that's not how you release it. And then they jerry rigged that. They, they passed all the legislation. It was 58 pages of corrections. And you had no way. It's like the, the, when they actually did release maps, 
the Ontario streets weren't this. You couldn't figure out if you're if you were between Damon and another street if you actually were in this one or the other one. I think we already uh, Damon was the worst one. Uh, like he got sort of posed. Like the second ward is like it looks like a like the one of those characters from Space Invaders. <laughs> so uh, so first like in, in response to that specifically and tying it back to the previous question, maybe one example would be for people who have some knowledge of the stuff to advocate for a change in the process of making those definitions to modernize it, to say that these actually can be effectively defined with technology instead of with sentences. And even if there are maybe, you know, access problems with that, that those access problems could be solved in a better way than going back to sentences and sentences of uh, inscrutable and possibly incorrect or impossible definitions. But I also kind of wanted to say to that question, I feel like asking what federal, state, and local government can do to sort of make the data easier kind of overlooks Branson's primary thesis, which is it's not just about delivering this to us after the decisions have been made. It's also about setting up processes whereby we can be involved in the decision making. And if we're involved in the decision making, then we probably would have access to that data. If it's a legitimate and honest involvement, then there'd be a, a way to ask for it and to get it or at least. Yeah, and that's a real problem with the way Illinois laws are set up because, um, as you know, um, in, uh, the Freedom of Information Act and the Open Meetings Act preliminary draft, uh, you know, is is an exception. And so, while certainly they were using GIS and doing their, um, you know, preliminary maps and negotiations on GIS, and the Freedom of Information Act says that the requester can request the information in the electronic format. That, that you want, and if the public body can provide it, they're obligated to provide it. But if it's a draft, which is what prohibits us from being able to impact policy decisions as they're being made, you know, the law, the structurally, the law is set up against participation. Yep. Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm struck, uh, I wanted to return to one of your premises, uh, Ramsey. Um, which were the structure uh, was what we needed. We needed st power structures that allowed for the greatest participation. In other words, that, that the decisions we make are of the will of the people. Um, and you gave some examples, um, of local school councils and charrettes and uh, community-based participatory research. And here in Chicago, we have. have you know, some participatory budgeting process that's being tried out, and I've I've helped out with um, with that uh, a little bit. Um, I'm always struck, and I was struck by Terry by something you said that that what, when a structure exists, whether it's in, and it's often on state law or something, mm -hmm. if they just don't like it, they'll change the structure. <coughs> um, so I always come back to that. That I never, my instinct is never to help. create Create an, an ordinance or a, or a or some sort of legislative structure that allows for these things to happen. I my instinct is always to go around it and try to find some make ready way that which is what I think citizens do all the time mm -hmm. to get to to do things that they want. Um, so my question would be: Does anybody here know of an existing structure that has has been brought up upon which we could add technology or bump up or add some some you know an existing real world structure because again we and, and Mike you talked about you know actually talking to people and, and uh, a lot of the work you know we do here at Smart Chicago is to focus on that um, portion. I don't know the structures that we could leverage. Number one, so I have that. I would ask people that. And number two, um, does it matter because then. What always happens is that if people in power don't want it to happen, it won't happen. How do we stop that? I don't know how to stop that. And one more on a rant now. <laughs> um, it, and uh, uh, Elna, as you said, uh, apathy is a real issue. We have to, and I know there's a lot of journalists in the room. Do you know that this month, one of the m most important newspapers in the country put someone named Daly in jail with a document that they found. They found data. They found a piece of paper through investigative journalism. They found data. They found something. And they put it on the front page of the paper and someone named Daly went to jail because of it. And is that on the top of anybody's minds in this room? No. no. Absolutely not. 
it, when it happens, when we have a great success of data being uncovered, of a piece of information that was previously hidden, hidden, that becomes known, it is not even, it's, it's front page news for a day on the, for the people who, who, who came up with the news. Um, otherwise, it's, it's nowhere. So, uh, I didn't mean it to be as bleak as that. Yeah, go team, but yeah. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if it matters. And maybe just, uh, 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 what can we do about that? Well, so, since I'm standing up here, uh, there's one thing I've always thought about that, and this is still very like a theoretical response, but from one of my beginning lenses on getting into this work was, um, I don't think it's only apathy, it's also a, mis a, a sense that there's no way to be involved. And part of that is because the sort of dynamic right now is really sort of professionalized. Either you're a politician or a player, or you're basically a professional crank. And no offense to any professional cranks in this room, I know there are some. But, um, but it's really hard for someone who's like, well, this, I don't want this to be my life. I want to know what's going on. I want to know when I can do something, but I also need some help. And it seems like there should be some technological solutions out, which I think also sort of feeds into this idea of participation, is what can we do um, as people who are uh, interested in and creative and sort of uh, immersed in these technologies to propose systems so that um, people could be part-time citizens in a way that's not an insult, but in a way that's actually just realistic and says, you know, some of us want to do more than vote every two or four years, and besides that, voting every two or four years is kind of removed from a feedback loop that would make the problems that happen with these uh, immediate policy gets changed, structure gets reversed, that doesn't get connected to consequences at voting, but is there a way that we can sort of set up technological systems that help people uh, engage without committing more of their time than they ever possibly could to do that? Great. Yeah, I just want to throw out a quick reminder that when we're talking about all the ways that people can participate in there's one that nobody ever thinks of, which is, and it's not for everybody, but you could actually work in the government. <laughs> you know, you, and I mean that, not, not sarcastically, but, you know, Dan, you talked about structures, and the thing, you know, that I always have to remind myself, structures are made up of people, and if, if, you, if you just uh, paint them all with the same brush and say, well, structures are structures, then you have to say that our friends here from the city are the same as everybody else in every other city, but the structure changed because the people got into the structure who could make a difference, and because they did, we're all sitting in this room talking about public data. For years, we were talking about public data, but there wasn't anything to talk about because it was no public data anymore. <laughs> you were there, Dan. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not for everybody, but I mean, it is an option if you want to participate. A year, two years in government service, um, you know, working for your local village or county or something, it's not a bad way to go if you really want to find out more about Hire me. work. And then, you know, and I, I just want to... How do I get hired? A shout out, a shout out to uh, Here's a process. I, I actually worked with a, a gentleman who had come into his career working for Mayor Washington. And it changed his life. And I think in some small way, he changed the city. So I'm not saying that structures just roll up and go away when good people get into government. But I mean, I think we can learn from that example that A, it's not perfect. B, it's better than nothing. When something changes by people getting involved. So that's one way to get involved. It's not the only way. There's thousands of ways to get involved. I could vouch for, you know, working in government as a way to learn. I would say have a backup plan because we're in the age of austerity now. The reason I don't work for the state anymore is because the state cut me and half the office. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah, to, to kind of answer uh, Dan a little bit and, and follow up on what you were saying. And um, I think Elma is... Um, sorry. Um, you know, what she said earlier too about apathy. I mean, it's true, and, and there have been studies done about this that that um, apathy is a big reason why people, especially, don't get involved in local government. When they do get involved in local government, it is when something is being developed in their neighborhood, um, or when a service is being uh, added or taken away from their community. Um, so it's true that generally people will be apathetic and and or at least not as engaged until something is potentially going to affect them. Now, as uh, Terry, you mentioned, we don't know when something's going to affect us until the public notice sign is put on the door and it's already basically been approved between the planning department and the developer. Mm -hmm. The reason we don't know that is because the, the documents aren't subject to FOIA because they're in draft, and there's no statute that requires actual early notice to people who are going to be affected. So if there was a statute in place that said 
that had real notice requirements. And in turn, those notice requirements had to be passed on to the people in a way that was facilitated by technology. Um, and and, and uh, in a way that, that was pushed through to them uh, at an earlier time. They would be more likely to get involved at an earlier point. And at that point, could take advantage of a structure like a charrette to actually impact what that development or that service is going to be. So it's true that these things are all connected, but it's not true that we can just say, well, um, structures will be abused. Of course they'll be abused. It's an ever-evolving society. Society's never been static. Or that um, apathy means that we can't rely on participation. There's going to be apathy, but apathy is a function of lack of awareness or lack of access, or like you're saying, a sense that it's there's nothing I'm going to be able to do anyway. So, um, so these these individual things all feed into each other, and create the desire to get involved when you know that you can get involved and you have the tools to get involved. So I do have a design for your, your idea, but not enough time to talk. <laughs> I just raise one quick thing. Um, that, so again, I say I'm Chicago native, and usually when I start out my stories, I, I get ideas from my family. And I was really proud of this one thing. I set, I was parsing through this data set, and it was particular it was abandoned properties, and I was trying to relate to school closures and show this. And I was really proud. I was going to show my grandma. I, I pulled HDMI cables, showed my big TV, with this giant map, all these data pods. Just like, what does that mean? <laughs> and uh, my grandma, like. Chicago native, my mom is Chicago native, grandma is Chicago native, born in Maxwell Street, which was closer to the at the time for many, many years, just retired. And I will say this though, be, be very cautious. When you guys make apps, when you guys make maps, they're predominantly going to be seen by people on the north side. They're going to be seen by people with smartphones, they're going to be seen by people with broadband internet access. You go into some of these neighborhoods, they don't have access to that. They don't even know what a GIS file is, they wouldn't know what an interactive chart is. Most of the time, they're reading it through the newspaper or reading it on TV or radio. And that's even if they're English speaking. There's a heavy Polish and Spanish speaking population in Chicago, one of the largest Polish speaking populations in the world here. And that data needs to sort of find other outlets of getting out beyond the technical, like, ooh, shiny sort of. Because it's going to play well in Lincoln Park, but it's going to play well in Lakeview. It won't play well in parts of south, west side, south side, and west side neighborhoods. This is Caution. Just a couple of thoughts about structure. It's sort of random, but um, one thing that struck me when Mike was talking is um, we have all this data being published all the time, and it sounds like a lot of engineers are looking at it and trying to think about how to solve problems. And yeah, that's not the most efficient way, but is there a way to collect the metadata about the data so that every you know so that every time you look at a data set, you could see what other people thought about that data set. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe even then take that one step forward and talk about how the platform to publish problems that can that the data can be brought to bear. So it's almost like a Venn diagram. You want problems, but you know, ideally you want want problems where the data can be brought to bear to solve them. Um, I can't solve everything, you know. So at least we'll start with the intersection of those two things. Um, and ideally, a third circle there would be a little bit of an economic perspective on it. Um, you know, I keep hearing volunteer um, grants, nonprofits. But at the end of the day, uh, when you look at the most successful open source efforts in um, in the tech industry, you see Mozilla Foundation. They actually pay people salaries <laughs> to work there. I know, and there are a lot of people who are willing to take cuts in their salary, they don't need to be at the you know highest level in their industry, but they do need to feed a family. Um, so if you want to grow a, a group of people, you don't want to only rely on sort of cognitive excess and cognitive overload of unemployed or you know people who have the flexibility to work when they can. But can we? I think we can smart Chicago uh, collaborate, be the budget foundation, you know, where you actually hire people and uh, and then so going back to the economic, that's you know if you can say these are problems, this is the data, and this is where there's economic value. That can be created so that people can be employed to um, to work on them. That would be uh, that's sort of my theme. Thank you. So um, it's it's ten after eight. We'll just like really quick, like last really fifty thoughts. Your hand up. That'd be good. That was a very important on the notion of you know economic value. I just moved from Colorado, and the Department of State in Colorado has come to understand what economic savings they can get from 
you know, crowdsourcing this like whole open data movement and encouraging municipalities to open their data. And Denver itself, when I left, which was like three months ago, they were just initiating a, a hiring for someone to go into their government and to have a position where they just network around within their government to say, hey, you need to open this data in this way, you know, for this community endeavor. What will it take to achieve that here? You know, can we sell our government by saying, look, this is the savings we'll get from opening this in this way? And like you guys are like, you know, a powerhouse of intellectual capacity. Like I'm sure we can come up with ways to say, all right, this is how much money we can save by instituting this policy of open government. And if that doesn't work, you know, let's send out a petition, get a ballot measure, because this is about streamlining democracy, so people would vote on it. Well, that's that's what I'm We're actually a pretty good chip. We have a chief data officer who does that going around. And in fact, people from this office are here. And uh, I think the city has at least some nominal awareness of the ways that they can improve efficiency and uh, and make things work better through government. Now, there are a lot of sometimes we try and call ourselves open government Chicago land, and there are a lot of places near Chicago that haven't necessarily gotten the picture. So that uh, yeah. is there. And it's not necessarily that everything in Chicago is perfect, but we do have. Progress has been being made on that front, for sure. The county also just posted a job for that's very similar in um, trying to develop relationships around open data. Okay. Well, but whoever these are, they need to network with organizations like yours and with the tech community to you, bring that track back. Yeah. Like like that's the most fun. That, that, so the hack that's been mentioned a lot. Thanks, Joe, for the, the plug. So we're coming up on one year of having the hack night. And I was thinking about this earlier today. It's We've come a long way in a year. I mean, you think about all the things that have happened and all the groups that are here. I mean, Smart Chicago Collaborative has exploded in terms of its impact. I mean, I have a for-profit company that's making money off of this community, off of open data uh, that the city has released. We have, you know, we have apps that started off in the beginning. I mean, Open City started off with what was available, right? Lobbyist data was released. We said, okay, let's make an app with that, right? Very much along what Mike was saying in terms of, oh, here's the data, here's the data, let's make a, an app with that. And I'd say that, you know, we've come a long ways from there, and now there's so much data that we can actually stop thinking about just here's data, let's look at a problem. Well, we have too much data to look at, and we have a growing group that can conti continue to evolve and do more amazing things with that data. So. Uh, I think that I, I'm feeling pretty positive about where we'll be a year from now. <laughs> I just want to say one thing to you. Uh, I'm not going to speak in the capacity of, uh, of my job, um, but um, one of the things I'm, uh, that's unfortunate, I think, is that, so I'm actually, so I actually work for the city, if you don't know. Um, I, I work in software development for the city, and um, the way I got there is by working with Derek and Paul on Chicago lobbyists and become and being one of these people that got engaged in civic hacking and I didn't I really didn't have a reason to do it I just thought it was interesting and there were some cool people to work on it on and I had extra cycles in my uh, in my time to do some stuff and uh, one of the things that that worries me is that there's a lot of critique on developers coming and just spending their time on doing stuff and a lot of like saying like it's I don't know I, I don't I don't want to like Say that everyone's bad mouthing it, but you know uh, what I'd rather see is people like Elmaz was saying and uh, coming and bringing their comments and offering suggestions rather than saying this is you know this is not the way to approach it. The, the people that are doing this, the the ninety five percent of the apps that are kind of available in Chicago, those are people that are kind of doing it on their their own time, just deciding that they care about something for a certain amount of time or that. They want to find something to care about for a certain amount of time. And they have the resources and the abilities to make some sort of change. And we should prop those people up and uh, find ways to help them out. I think that's a good closing note. So, in the light of what Greg said, people can go work in government. We got more than one person here tonight who, Casey, came out of this community into working for government organizations, getting paid for it. Um, people who have made uh, a way to make a living getting paid for it, to follow this point, not only doing it on a volunteer basis. We've come a long way. There's still a long way to go. I think you know, one of our motivations to do this tonight was to get beyond that you know, open government as being open data and to open up some of these questions, especially about participation and inclusion and uh, ways to apply technology to more than just processing 
uh, sort of efficiency and uh, effectiveness there. So um, this has been a really great discussion. I really thank you to all of our speakers, Branson, Terry. <laughs> We have a Google Doc of meeting notes. People can add stuff to. We also have a Google Doc of things to read about this. Join our Google group and uh, let us know what we should do for the next meeting. I don't think we have a thought yet, so uh, give us your ideas. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right, that's it. Good night, America.